Hello everybody, I am here with Dr. Michael Hamblin, who is a PhD. He is a principal investigator at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's an associate professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School and is a member of the affiliated faculty of the Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology. He has um, he publishes a lot of papers on LLT, low, la low level laser therapy for wound healing, arthritis, traumatic brain injury, neurodegenerative diseases, and psychiatric disorders. He has published 284 peer reviewed articles and uh, over 150 conference proceedings, book chapters, and international ab abstracts, and he holds eight patents. He is associate editor for seven journals, on the editorial board of further 12 journals, and serves on, N on NIH study sections. To begin, can you give people a broad idea of the mechanisms by which la laser therapy works, LLT? Okay, so the, the predominant mechanism <clears throat> is the absorption of red or near-infrared photons. So with red, we're talking about 600 to 700 nanometers, and near-infrared, we're talking about 780 to as high as 11 or 1200 nanometers. So two broad bands, red and near-infrared, and they're probably both absorbed by chromophores in the mitochondria, uh, specifically cytochrome C oxidase. And one of the main biochemical events is the dissociation of nitric oxide, which binds to the metal centers in cytochrome C oxidase, inhibits the enzyme activity, it inhibits respiration, and reduces ATP. So nitric oxide is basically inhibiting the mitochondria and the light photo dissociates nitric oxide allowing oxygen to come into the sites and respiration electron transport ATP production all rise so there's a big changes in the mitochondria and there's a lot of signaling events happen due to these changes in the mitochondria and the things that produce the signaling events are a burst of reactive oxygen species, um, you get cyclic AMP from the extra ATP, you get the nitric oxide that's released, can do a lot of signaling as well. Um, so there's several signaling events that occur relatively short term around the light, you know, talk within a few minutes. But these signaling events have long-term consequences. So they activate transcription factors. And what transcription factors do is they go in the nucleus, they bind to various elements of the DNA, and they signal transcription of a whole lot of new proteins. And this takes hours, days, and even weeks. So that there are many cases where a single exposure to light will have long-lasting effects days or weeks after. That's incredible. And um, so how do you use, uh, do you use laser therapy personally for your own uses and, and how do you use it? What, like, what do you use it for? Okay, so when you say laser therapy, I generally talk about light therapy because although the whole thing was discovered in 1967 by Andre Mester using a ruby laser, and for many years, people thought that lasers had some magical quality that other light sources don't have. <coughs> now, because of the widespread use of LEDs, LEDs are very cheap and available. People have figured out that you can actually use LEDs, which are a fraction of the price. You can illuminate much broader areas of tissue, and the whole thing is just a lot easier. And there's no danger. So Lasers, in principle, could cause eye damage, so they were controlled, there were laser regulations. So that tended to mean that only certain licensed practitioners could use lasers, but now LEDs are you know, easily available over the internet. You can buy powerful devices for not a lot of money. So I expect most people will have an LED device at home, and they will use it on themselves. I see. I have a LED device plugged in by my bed, and every morning I put it on some 
part of my anatomy that I believe could do with some stimulation. Uh, so I, if I have a sore elbow or a sore knee or um, sometimes I put it on my eyes because I reckon eyesight is maybe failing or otherwise you put it on your forehead to uh, give your brain a boost so you can use it on all parts of your anatomy whatever you think could benefit from the light how how often do you use it on your brain uh two or three times a week and for how long 15 minutes 15 minutes each time so it's all together or in each spot no i just usually put it on my forehead on your forehead why not all over the brain well because hair is a good blocker of light so uh, behind your forehead is your prefrontal cortex, which is a, a good part of your brain to deliver the light to, and also that your forehead does not have hair, so the light goes in easily. And if, if you don't have any hair, you, then you have more um, opportunities to put it on other parts of your brain. But I've, I've got no problem in that department. <laughs> Um, I large your forehead is a good place to put it. But even when I did have uh, more hair, I uh, I would put it on places where I had hair, and I did definitely feel an effect when I put it on the rest of my head. So it is having an effect. Do you think that's true, or it's a placebo response in me? Also, you can feel the effects when you put light on your head in two different ways. Okay, You can feel a tingling in your scalp which is actually due to the nitric oxide being released in the skin of your scalp. And then sometime after, especially if you use near-infrared light, you can feel an effect on your, let's say, your emotions and your cognition. So, you, you know, people describe it as feeling like a bit of euphoria, a bit of enhanced concentration, like you can think clearer. People describe it in different ways, but you can definitely feel an effect on your mind. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for like half an hour or so, something like that. And what and what effects have you noticed over the years of like putting it on your your forehead, like uh, in in terms of cognitive uh, function? Well, I mean, you know, obviously you don't notice it making a change because you can't do a randomized trial on yourself. You, <laughs> you control. You don't have any placebo, but um, but subjectively, you notice any... Um, well, I should say you, you can feel, especially if you have a, a decent power. The device I have at home is not huge power, but there is a helmet which has 12 watts of optical power. And that was made by a company. It's uh, quite expensive. It was the, the, the first one, I believe, cost $25,000. So that was quite an expensive device. And I've tried that, and that really has an effect. Mm -hmm. To some degree, you get what you pay for. The device I have is 2 watts, and it costs about $300. So you, you get what you pay for. Um, so how does that work with the, the more watts you have, the more of an effect it's going to have on you? By and large, but there is a limit. As, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, you, in principle, you can give too much light. So you've got to bear that in mind. You, you know, it's not really if you want a huge amount of power, right? I mean, you could put kilowatts. I mean, it is possible to get kilowatts of light, but that would be too much. Mm -hmm. A, and start heating things up, and B, you would almost certainly overdose on it. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is like the upper limit of watts that somebody would want to... Well, it's a, it's a power density thing. So, you know, the upper limit of power density is probably... 100 milliwatts per square centimeter. Mm -hmm. So you could put 100 milliwatts per square centimeter on a small bit on your forehead, or you could put it all over your head, right? Right. And because your head is like 400 square centimeters, you know, mm -hmm. you, you need a lot of total power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they sell like lasers that are 100 uh, milliwatts and and putting that that would be like 100 that would be like the upper limit to put it on a specific spot yeah but you would only do one little spot right, right yeah but that would be like the very upper limit you know it's the number of photons that go in your brain as far as we know mm -hmm. um, so if you only had a 100 milliwatt laser you'd need to spend hours going over right <laughs> <laughs> not very efficient i i agree with that so yeah so i use like um what about like uh, so i use uh you know a cctv or um a light relief device they're pretty cheap and um they got like 850 nanometers uh 
I, I forgot the exact wattage, but yeah, so it's pretty spread out. It's not too powerful. Do you okay. think? Do you think these CCTV devices? Have you ever looked into them at all? No, I, I think I know what you what you're talking about is a security lighting device. So it's mm -hmm. it's a floodlight which is invisible. And mm -hmm. Security companies use it to invisibly illuminate an area so that an intruder is picked up on a camera but they don't know it. Mm -hmm. to, to, to their perception is totally dark. Right. So these are very good value devices because you know, that's, uh, we have one or two in the lab. One we got, I think, was like 72 watts of optical power and it was to illuminate whole cages of mice or rats. So you could put this floodlight on top of the cage and all the little mice and rats would run around under the near infrared light and, and receive quite a good dose without any hassle. Mm -hmm. Can you get through, like there's some devices that have glass, um, that you know, that have glass blocking them. Can, you, can, can 850 nanometers get through a thin layer of glass? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not only glass, but it goes through other things. You know, to some degree, it goes through clothing. I mean, it, it's not great to put light through clothing, but to some degree, it does. I've heard thin white clothing. Mm -hmm. I've heard different um, takes. Uh, some places I read that infrared can go through glass, and some some scientists tell me that it it can't go through glass. I, I think it depends on the the wavelength of the infrared. In infrared goes all the way from seven hundred. Uh, nanometers up to 50 microns. So, uh -huh. but the therapeutic things we're talking about are in the near infrared from like 800 up to maybe 1200. What Those about 660 nanometers? That's red light that goes through glass. Yeah. <laughs> so you're um, so from 660 um, all the way to the far infrared that all that goes into glass. No, I, I, I'm not sure about far infrared. I think it probably does. Okay, but so the, the fire infrared is ten microns and above. Mm -hmm. Probably does, but I'd have to check. But but let's say up to let's say a thousand nanometers is going to go. Through glass just fine. Yeah. It goes through glass. Okay, that's great to know. Um, you, you 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 just have to think about you know when the sun's shining, you're sitting in your car, the heat goes through the window, right? right you can yeah. feel the sun hitting <laughs> your skin through the window, and that's infrared, right? Right, right. Uh, that's interesting. Have you ever looked into? I spoke to a scientist, Dr. Gerald Pollack. Have you ever heard of him? Oh no, he he studies uh, uh, what's called structured water, and according to his experiments, he found that infrared light structures the water in your body, and if you just shine it on water, the water that you drink, and that infra that structured water in the body has a whole bunch of properties in the body, and it's. It's an underappreciated field in science, but he's a uh, researcher at the University of Washington, and um, he studies, you know, a senior researcher, and he studies how the the structured water in your body, because basically you get structured water around every protein. That's that's um, uh, that's how that works. So, I'm, I'm so let, 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 let me pick up on that and and tell you a, about a second broad area of the mechanism of action. Mm -hmm. which is to do with ion channels. Mm. Now, it turns out that there are light-sensitive ion channels, which, believe it or not, is how insects use their vision. Okay, mm -hmm. So if you're an insect, you do not have rods and cones and retinal and photoreceptors like animals do. You have a completely different system which relies on light-sensitive ion channels. So you, you may have heard that mosquitoes buzzing around can sense body heat. Yeah. You know that? Oh, well, I'm sure they can because <laughs> that's probably how they know. Right, uh, so they actually see the infrared. Oh, okay. You skip by these light-sensitive ion channels in their eyes. So these light-sensitive ion channels are also in mammalian cells. They don't use them for vision, but they're in the cells. And the question is... You know, these these ion channels are sensitive to visible light, but also infrared, quite a broad range of infrared. And sometimes, they're, you know, they're called heat sensors as well. So it is possible that structured water has a role to play in why these ion channels are light sensitive. Mm. Because 
you know, both visible and near infrared light can be absorbed by structured water. I mean, that is well known. There are many physics papers that say that. But why should it have any biological effect? Mm -hmm. The answer may be that it allows ion channels to raise the intracellular calcium level. And calcium is a big thing for cell signaling. There's lots of signaling cascades that are initiated by calcium. So being able to open ion channels and let the calcium in could do a lot of signaling as well. But usually that's associated with bad effects, like ne like if there's too much calcium in the cell. Yeah, um, well, again, again, it's it's all a matter of dose. You know, reactive oxygen species is also bad, it's, right? <laughs> bad effects, but it's known in for small amounts for brief periods, it can be very beneficial. And also for calcium, a small increase in calcium does positive signaling. A, a huge influx of calcium kills the cell. Exactly right. So that's that's yeah that's a good differentiation. What about like how you know compared to the sun? How much um, you know when we, we we get infrared from the sun too, and I think a lot uh, very few people are you know that we're we're living indoors most of the time, so we're not getting the amount of sun that we that we historically got. Um, how does like that compare to you know the infrared that we're getting from these LEDs? Okay, so. The, the, the total solar irradiance is about 140 milliwatts per square centimeter with a peak in the green, okay? okay. It's less red and there's even less near infrared. There is near infrared, you're quite right, but it's not a huge amount. I guess it's 20 or 30 milliwatts per square centimeter total of near infrared, you know, so it's beneficial. I mean, it's, it's long been known that going out in the sun is beneficial in terms of photobiomodulation. It's it's bad for you if you get too much UV. Right. Sure. No question. So, mm -hmm. um, but in the twenties and the thirties, they built all these clinics in the Alps in Germany and Austria, so people could expose them <coughs> themselves to the sun in the cool mountain air. Right. So, it's it's heliotherapy is much more effective in cool mountain air than it is if you go and lie on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, uh, people went to these clinics and got healed with all sorts of things like non-healing wounds, and, you know, like arthritis, all sorts of conditions that you would not expect to be benefited from sun exposure. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, I see, so you're saying that the sun does have infrared, but we're not getting the quantities that we may need to heal certain things. I, I'm saying I think that to get the correct dose from the sun, you would need to worry about UV, UV. exposure, mm -hmm. and you would also be much better if you were at a high altitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are you familiar with any effects on LLT and the circadian rhythm? Because the circadian rhythm has, you know, that. That's got a lot of effects, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus that senses more blue light. But I'm I'm curious if you know, um, just in general, if you have any information on that, the circadian rhythm and laser uh, and and photons. So, I mean, obviously, bright light therapy is the treatment of choice for jet lag and you know seasonal affective depression and. Basically, <clears throat> the light is absorbed in the eyes, so you need the sort of full face. You, see, you, know, you have these panels which are either blue or bright white. And the peak in the action spectrum was, I think, identified as 470. So this is mm -hmm. definitely in the blue. Right. So it's not clear that near infrared light has any benefit on circadian rhythms. I mean, it might do because it's kind of good for your brain. You know, right. it might reset something, but. If if you had jet lag or seasonal affective disorder, I would recommend bright white or blue light. Have you ever used that for yourself? Oh, uh, never have. You never have. Okay. Um, and and how does somebody know? How would somebody know if uh, you know if it's too much? Would they have? At, 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 do, will they start getting side effects if it's too much, or they have to just look at the specs of it and say, well, if you just take too much power, you're going to have too much. Yeah, it's, it's difficult because it's a, it's a gradual process. So if you've been using light therapy and finding some benefit, and then if you said, 
okay, that's good, I, I really like this, I'm going to use more of it, and then the benefit went away, that would be a big hint you were over. <laughs> right. um, in terms of side effects, there are very few side effects. I've, I've occasionally heard of people who put light on their head. I think one person had a headache, and a few other people have felt excessively sleepy. So, especially if you, if you have problems sleeping, right, you have some insomnia, or a lot of people with head injuries or psychiatric disorders have problems sleeping, and you put the light on your head, it can make you really sleepy quickly. And, and so, um, Marnie Nays are actually, she treats people in her office because she's doing controlled trials, and she tells them not to come and drive in, to get somebody else to drive them in, and in case they fall asleep when they're driving home. Mm -hmm. What what do you think the mechanism? I actually think that's very interesting because when I first used the laser therapy, I also got sleepy. But um, what I found is as I built my and 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 I'm someone who you know uh, I've had to deal with chronic fatigue historically, but not anymore. I've I've kind of fixed myself. Um, but what I uh, you know I'm thinking that I, I was always trying to think of what the mechanism is. So I was thinking maybe uh, you know if you've got like let's say a lot of inflammation in your brain. Um, and so LLT is, you know, it's transiently increasing inflammation, and we know that inflammation suppresses orexin, the wakefulness neurotransmitter. I was thinking that perhaps um, that's like a mechanism by which it was making people sleepy, but if you don't, if you're like very healthy and you don't have these, you know, any kind of inflammation going on, then that's why I don't feel sleepy anymore when I do it. Uh, do, you, do you know of any mechanism why somebody would be sleepy and then they wouldn't be sleepy, you know, if somebody, generally the people who are healthy and don't have any fatigue issues don't get sleepy. Like, I bet if you tried it, you wouldn't get sleepy. Yeah, I think it depends how much sleep you get, you know, I mean, if you, um, but I, <clears throat> I want to pick up on one thing you mentioned, you said that um, fitted by modulation gives a transit increase in inflammation. That's only true if you don't have a state of chronic inflammation. So when you use mm. laser therapy for any disease which involves chronic inflammation, the and the dosimetry is right, it will be anti-inflammatory, so it will reduce inflammation. Oh, that's very interesting. That, that's been shown in many, many different situations. You know, a lot of orthopedic things, autoimmune things. I mean, light therapy is really heavily used as an anti-inflammatory. And it's, it's much got much less side effects than steroids and, and you know non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and all these other things which sort of work but they have a lot of side effects and get sort of habituated to them. Uh, and then you talked about neuroinflammation. So neuroinflammation is being recognised is is quite a big deal. Um, it's very br bad for your brain to even have a chronic low level of inflammation and it could well be that the beneficial effects of light therapy to the head are because it reduces neuroinflammation. <clears throat> you know, it's been shown in, in several specific models where you had a stroke or a brain injury that light therapy reduces inflammatory cells in the brain. Mm -hmm. So what would be like a mechanism by which it's making people tired? Something's happening. Uh, and whereas other people are not getting tired. Something is going on. Well, I think the people are tired anyway, but they're unable to sleep. Oh, I see. I, I think that's the key thing. And the light therapy somehow re releases the block that's stopping them sleeping. Oh, that's very interesting. Because, you know, uh, people with head injuries or psychiatric disorders nearly always have sleeping problems. Right. Sometimes they're terrible. You know, they, they, they sleep sorry very disturbed and you get a few hours sleep a night and you put the light therapy on their head and then it kind of somehow relaxes them. <laughs> so all it, this is there, what's the mechanism by how it, how it unplugs their system? Is, the, yeah. is, there, is, is that something that we need further research on? I believe so, yeah. <laughs> um, I hear. Neurotransmitters could well be involved and you know, there's some evidence that serotonin metabolism and glutamate 
metabolism are affected by light. But it's it's not firmly worked out yet. What would the effects be on, like, let's say, the the, the preliminary uh, ideas on serotonin and glutamate? I'm assuming it's reducing glutamate if it's making some people tired. Yeah, that you get, certainly if you have disorder in glutamate, you know, like excited toxicity, this sort of thing, it will reduce it, yes. And serotonin, I believe, people have found serotonin metabolites in the urine. So there's some evidence that serotonin metabolism has increased. Mm. That's interesting. It's just, I, I'm just fascinated how it could have such dual effects because in some ways, you, you know, you're saying when, when, if somebody doesn't have inflammation, it'll transiently increase it and, and that could be good, you know, some very transient increases in order to stimulate growth and things like that. And whereas the people who uh, have chronic inflammation, it works in a different way. Yeah, I mean... Um, and so, also, yeah, and somebody who... And, and I'm assuming that it might work differently be, because if somebody has excess glutamate, um, uh, increasing cellular calcium would even be worse. Um, uh, so, so I'm assuming it, that could also work differently. So... So one thing that, that, that sort of goes through the whole mechanistic story, right, is that light therapy produces a small increase in something which then induces a protective response against it. Mm -hmm. So when you say <coughs> light therapy produces a burst of ROS, that's true, and you get more antioxidant defenses. So if light produces a small burst of calcium, then maybe the the metabolic changes in the cell go to reduce the calcium back to a homeostasis level. So it's some, you know, like the pumps are pumping calcium out because they're activated by this small influx or something like mm, that. I see what you're saying. So it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, definitely it's, it's, your work has shown that it's working by hormesis. It's a, a kind of oh, yeah. I, I, I think hormesis is very, and also preconditioning, right? So there was a people are starting to shine light onto animal models, and then do something and see if they're protected by having light shone on them beforehand. You know, it can protect against a heart attack. It can protect against a stroke. And there was a recent paper saying you could prevent against a head injury, right. uh, which is not of huge clinical significance, but mechanistically it's very important because it kind of tells you what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, it, something that's puzzling to me is, so if ROS is uh, oxidative stress is very elevated, chronically elevated in somebody, the adaptive mechanism wasn't working, so it's obviously doing something else. Uh, besides just increasing ROS a little, that's that's yeah, I mean, that increasing it increases the adaptive mechanism. How is that working? Well, I mean, so we we actually published a paper in vitro looking at oxidative stress in in primary cortical neurons. It was an in vitro cell culture paper, and what we found is that in normal neurons, the 810 nanometer laser increased ROS, but mm. in Neurons that had already had oxidative stress, so their level of ROS was 10 times higher than normal, light therapy decreased it. That's incredible. And so we don't know whether this small burst of ROS is one of the key things that, that responsible for the action, but... Um, it, it would seem some, like something else is going on. Something well, else big. Things are going on. Right. <laughs> cyclic AMP, the nitric oxide. There are many things going on, and trying to figure out which is the most important. They're probably all important to some degree, and and right. then the calcium channels is probably also important. Right. Um, what about like let's say okay so uh, the time of day? Um, do you is your did your research show that it's been more beneficial in the day, at night, or it doesn't make a difference? You never studied that. You never studied time of day. No research on that? I don't think so. I've never mm -hmm. come across any. Okay. Um, and what about, like, um, far infrared? How is How are those effects different? I don't know. So there's probably 
some sort of continuum. There's the, there's the red, right? And then in the 700s, there's like a valley. So 730 nanometers almost does nothing. Okay, 700, 730, 760. Does nothing. No, no, bio, no healthy biological effects. Absolutely. Incredible. Then, okay. Then when you get near to 800, the effects come back. Mm -hmm. they, they stay... I mean, people have not studied a huge number of wavelengths, but, you know, in the 1,500 nanometers, that seems to do something. And then, you know, broad band far infrared, in other words, centered around 10 microns, but the width of the band is like 20 microns wide. This is really broad band. That obviously does something. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that all the wavelengths from 800 up to 10 microns do the same thing. Possible. I'm not saying for, it's for sure. But it's also possible they do different things? Yeah, I mean, obviously, at those wavelengths, water is the principal chromophore, right? I mean, you can't get away from the name for the biology that water is by far the most prevalent constituent in biological tissue, and at those wavelengths, water is the principal chromophore by a long way. There's not no other chromophore even gets near water. Mm -hmm. So clearly, water is the chromophore. And, and when you say chromophore, it's it's a it's absorbing the light, it's absorbing the photons. Yeah. Okay. And you know you, you mentioned the structured water, so it's probably that's why it affects the ion channels. Mm -hmm. Because nobody quite knows why this infrared opens the ion channels. It's probably mm -hmm. something to do with the structured water and the protein in the in the actual transmembrane channel. Mm hmm. And so what happens after these ion channels are open? Calcium goes in the cell. Calcium goes in the cell, okay. But, but it, 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 there was a paper published a few years ago that showed it was a periodic phenomenon. So they used a confocal microscope and they found like a periodic oscillation in calcium. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like calcium rushed in and that was it. Mm. So this is probably because ion channels are opening and closing, and then there's you know, there's pump out. So each time the ion channel opens, calcium goes in, then it gets pumped out again. And what about the different like you know? There's I have a bulb that has 850 nanometers, and then I have the LEDs that have 850 nanometers. Um, what are what are, are is there going to be different effects with those? Like the bulb is much more hot. You can't put that as close. I'm assuming it might have different effects. I, I don't feel it as much. Uh, the the LEDs seem to be much more beneficial. I think you're right. I think LEDs are better than lamps by the, much. The LEDs are better than lamps. I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure why, you know. I mean, I'm not either. <laughs> right, that's <laughs> what I'm curious. Like, why? They're both 850 nanometers, uh, but something's different. Well, I mean, the the bulb, I suspect, is much broader. I suspect. I don't, I don't mm. know. Oh, okay. That could Spectrum. be. Mm. What about, um, so you used, um, is there any concern like using, I, I know when I used, uh, you know, when I put it near my eyes, my eyes actually hurt a little, um, very slightly. I mean, is, is that, is that a concern? 850. 850, yeah. Can't see it. You can see a very faint red. I don't see it, but, but I'm saying like my eyes feel it, um, like the next day maybe. Hmm? probably good for them <laughs> right okay yeah it, it, i my I, I never get damaged from them i'm just curious like That's okay i'm feeling something you know but it's, it's probably the same feeling as you feel on your skin i mean you feel a little tingling on your skin right In your eyes it's probably the same thing interesting and and what kind of i um do you think it's possible so the, i think uh, there were some studies with cataracts and things like that well, I think um, it's more in the retina. The cataracts, the cornea. Right. Okay. So, what is it doing? Retina. So, you know, as you get older, your retina wears out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, most old folks. When I say old, like eighties, right? <laughs> Their eyesight is not what it was when they were young. Right. It, regardless of of, of uh, refraction, right? We're talking, you know, photoreceptors. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Obviously, the older you get, things start to wear out. You want to try and keep them going as long as possible, and light therapy is a good way of doing that. That's interesting. And uh, do you think it can improve, let's say, myopia, possibly? 
Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it has any effects on refractive problems. I mean, maybe. I don't, I'm not <laughs> well, an ophthalmologist. <laughs> okay. I'm um, sure it can preserve your retinal photoreceptors from degenerating. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. I, yeah, I actually use it on different places as well. I use it on my thymus, and I notice that um, I know, like I, I notice uh, my my I'm, I notice my immune system increases actually. Like I I feel in a way like um, you know in a way you know when you just get your temperature increases, you you feel like your immune system is stimulated. So when I use it on my thymus, uh, have you ever looked into um, research on that or no? No. <laughs> um, there were some studies on the thyroid. Uh -huh, so, but Maria Chavantes in Brazil is, so the, the, there's an autoimmune thyroiditis, which is, is you know, relatively common autoimmune disease. So because light therapy is anti-inflammatory, it's good for this autoimmune thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. um, it would, does, um, what it, what would be like the mechanism by which it's decreasing antibodies? Let's say because I think they did show a decrease in antibodies. Is there but, just by decreasing systemic inflammation? Maybe I think so. Yeah, I believe I believe it's the anti-inflammatory effect because mm -hmm. all, all the immune system is governed by pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Right. And, right. And light therapy tends to increase anti-inflammatory cytokines, so TGF-beta and interleukin-10. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the main thing. You know, people have shown that pro-inflammatory cytokines are reduced, so TNF-alpha and... Uh, Interleukin-1-beta, maybe? IL-1-beta. Right. What about, um, so there, there was like a rat study on, uh, they put it on the testes to increase testosterone. Right. Um, I guess I'm I'm just a little scared. Like, uh, will I be fertile? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 I think light therapy used with reasonable parameters will increase fertility. So. Oh, so you think the opposite could potentially well, happen? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so you know, and, and and there's been some studies with, you know, like artificial insemination with. Uh, cattle sperm that it's improved the motility and the survival and all this sort of stuff so um, yeah, I think for things like in vitro fertilization why wouldn't you study light therapy because it could mm -hmm. improve the whole procedure what about like um, yeah what about like uh, using it on your gut so um, I use it on my 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 gut like on my stomach area on my te intestinal area there's a few things that I'm thinking about there I think uh, I'm thinking that I think some of the probiotics in your intestines. I think they're. Uh, I, I think I read that they're sensitive to light. Um, well, a, a lot of my microbes are sensitive to blue light. In other words, blue light will kill them. Now, red and near infrared light, you know, have some effect on, on microbial cells. Probably not as much as they have on mammalian cells. Right, but um, let's say if I put it on my gut, you think it would, uh, or if people put it on their gut, that you think. It, Theoretically, it could increase gut turnover or the health of the gut. Yeah, it's possible. I it's mean, possible. You know, I think you, I think tissue optics are working against you there because a you've got your abdominal wall and then mm. you've got a lot of guts in there, so it's probably only the wall of the gut that's really near the surface is going to get any appreciable light. <laughs> oh, I see. That's that's very interesting. But uh, but one one company came up with this idea, you know, because they, they want to reduce inflammation in, in like, um, you know, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and all these diseases of the gut where there's too much inflammation, right? So they came <laughs> up with this idea of a pill which contains LEDs, red near infrared LEDs, and it's programmed to switch on when it gets to your intestines. So oh, wow. Goes through your stomach, through Incredible. your intestine, and then it switches itself on in the area of inflammation, and blasts out all this light, and then you can collect it at the other end, I guess, and recharge <laughs> it. <laughs> That's incredible. Has is there any conditions which, um, like uh, neurodegenerative conditions, that in animal studies or whatnot that hasn't been helped by laser therapy? 
Which conditions have you seen that it, it doesn't help with? Okay, so, so Miami Nasa did a study on people who had aphasia after a stroke. Okay, mm -hmm. so they couldn't speak. And initially she put her lights all over their head. And then I spoke to her and she said, ah, shoot, I think I'm making these folks worse with the light therapy. Oh, wow. So she was a bit upset at that. And then she realized that the area of the brain concerned with speech is on the left-hand side. Ah. So instead of treating them all over the head, she only treated the left-hand side of the head. And not only did they did she not make them worse, she actually made them better. Oh, wow. So without realizing it, she did her own crossover <laughs> trial. <laughs> it was my accident for her. <laughs> so, you know, so for some brain disorders, whereabouts on the head you put the light may be important. But this has not really been studied much at all. Mm -hmm. and what about the preliminary trials on traumatic brain injury? Did, were people less fatigued overall? Did it help with fatigue? Absolutely. It abs oh, wow. Okay. And um, what about like the – you've written a review article on infrared clothes. So it yep. has – yeah, it has uh, ceramic lace clothing. Ceramic nanoparticles. So this is, this is no external power, right? So mm -hmm. this is using the heat from the body to activate these ceramic nanoparticles to readmit – far infrared into the body. So, you know, your body is emitting infrared, but it's also emitting convection and conduction, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the convection and the conduction that heat up these nanoparticles to put far infrared back in the body. So you're actually getting more far infrared in than you put out. Mm. What about, is, does it make a difference? Like there's some companies that sell like you know, expen very expensive products, and then I've seen, I bought um, like UA cold gear that has ceramic particles that they say, you know, um, kind of retains your heat. So I'm assuming that that is retaining the infrared. Is that something that would suffice, you think? So, people have not quite figured out what's the best use of this clothing, right? I mean, it, you could say it's a medical thing. You meant to <coughs> treat, you know, medical conditions, you know, arthritis and various problems, this, that and the other. You could say that it's for increasing athletic performance. Um, mm -hmm. There's been one or two studies, if you're a cyclist and you wear clothing made out of this stuff, you perform better. And then it could just be for, like, outdoor mountaineering. I mean, there's companies that make clothing out of this just because it's much better is insulating if you, you know, mm -hmm. clamp up in the sort of ice pack, you know, and it keeps right. warm better. So there's all sorts of possibilities for this. And it, by and large, the, the medical benefits exist, but they're not, like, overpowering, right? right like, right. therapy does it better. Mm, I see. Uh, and, and do you think, like, let's say that just uh, a UA cold gear or something that just has ceramic particles that retains heat? Is that something you think would have an effect, or has an effect? I believe so. Yeah. I I see. Okay, that's but interesting. The Japanese have these infrared saunas, and the Koreans. Mm -hmm. I have an infrared sauna. You have one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does you it can work? buy one. You can buy one for a thousand bucks. It's a two-person. It's 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 very nice. It's wood. It smells good. Uh, looks nice, and and I go in, and it, it's amazing. You sweat. It just makes you feel really good after. Okay. So, have, have you tried to compare it with a regular sort of steam sauna? Mm, I've been in a regular steam sauna, but not it recently. So, I, you know, I, 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 not at this stage, I couldn't compare them now. Okay. So, yeah, what do you, what do you think of that? The infrared sauna, far, but they're usually far infrared saunas. Far infrared. Yeah. I'm, so, what, it's, what, it's, it's the same principle as the clothing, except it's much more concentrated far yeah. infrared, right? So, you think that would have additional benefits over just the infrared? Uh, without, I, I, I think personally, oh, oh, just a regular sauna, let's say. It, a far, a far infrared sauna should have more effect than a steam sauna. That's sure. that's very interesting. And um, what about uh, pulsed versus non-pulsed? So, the, you know, some some people are trying to see if there's additional benefits with pulsed. What what do you think of of that? 
uh, well, we wrote a review about pulsing. You probably read it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it was a challenge writing that review because the pulse parameters were all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. frequency was one of the things we looked at. So anything from like two or three hertz. So hundreds of hertz, kilohertz, tens of kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz, even megahertz, right? And so like six or seven orders of magnitude. And the conclusion was if you're going to do pulsing, don't make the frequency too high because the cells just get confused. So mm -hmm. 10 hertz is a good frequency, maybe 100 hertz, something in between. Mm -hmm. Once you get into kilohertz, the cells can't respond to that. Rapid. What what yeah. about it's very interesting. What about using it in in like the nose? I use a infrared device that gives uh, infrared through the nose. How is that working? I, you know, how does the brain it's absorbed by the blood? It what? I believe that light up the nose is absorbed by the circulating blood. Mm. I don't believe it gets to the brain. Although Lou Lim says you put five or ten milliwatts up your nose, it gets into your brain. I mean, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's it's this uh it's getting into it's uh the circulation? It's getting into the blood. Okay. And, you know. It definitely has an effect. I feel I'm it sure on my brain. I'm um, sure it does. Yeah. yeah. And, and and we believe that one of the main mechanisms for laser radiation of blood is the mit is the platelets. So platelets mm. have a lot of mitochondria. Mm. They are major sources of A, ATP, but a lot of growth factors. Mm. So the platelets, we think, are very sensitive to light, and they can have a lot of beneficial effects. That's very interesting. Now, what about um, laser therapy and cancer? So I know this photodynamic therapy where they give, you know, you give a chemical, and that's actually supposed to kill the cancer, but what about using laser therapy without uh, uh, a chemical that will kill it, uh, you know, w that will... That, that will draw the, the laser therapy is supposed to draw the chemical to a certain area, um, and that's supposed to like kill the cancer cells. But putting, you know, it, it, are we, you know, it, since laser therapy is increased, increasing growth in the brain, are we to be maybe scared that it could theoretically increase brain cancer or wherever you're putting it because you're increasing growth factors? Yeah, so there's two issues here. One, can laser therapy cause cancer? And yes. the answer is certainly no. There is no conceivable way that light therapy, laser therapy could induce the kind of mutations that would cause cancer. Now, the next question is what happens if you have a very early sort of malignant or pre malignant lesion that's only a few cells? Could light or laser therapy make it grow faster? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes, it's, it's entirely possible. Mm. There's been a few studies where people have put light therapy onto you know, animal models with pre-malignant lesions or early cancers and we've seen they grow more. Mm. Okay, and, then, and, and I'm assuming if it's more well-developed, then that's probably not either a good idea to put it on. Well, you know, if you have cancer, you know, you've had some treatments, I think that laser therapy could be beneficial because it stimulates the immune system. Right? Mm, I um, see. So if you put it on your thymus, that would be a good idea. That maybe. would probably be better than putting it right <laughs> on where the tumor is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, what it, but putting it on the tumor is probably not a good idea? Probably not a great idea, but, right. you know, but who knows? But who knows? Because if, right. if you already have an immune response, it's possible putting it on the tumor could increase the action of the immune cells attacking the tumor. So, right. But, it's, uh, you know, obviously these are very early days. and um, you know, there's, there's been one or two reports of <coughs> light therapy having amazing effects on people with advanced cancer. Mm -hmm. There's very few, you know, like, but... And have those been positive or? Yeah. They have been positive. And they used it on the tumor. Well, these are usually people with advanced cancer, you know, metastases, the whole thing. Oh, I see. Who knows where the light actually <laughs> went. You know? I hear you. And what, so that's, this is all very fascinating. Um, wh what do you think the future of laser therapy is? Where is this going? Well, uh, as, as I said at the beginning, I believe that everybody will have at least one LED device in their home. 
and maybe they'll have two or three, you know, one for their head, <laughs> one for their nose, one for their gut, or whatever. I'm already there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the future. Um, but it, what, do you think, like, is any advancement of technology within laser therapy, that, that, or it's just this is what it is? Well, I think wearable light sources may come in. So mm. you know, people, rather than sort of sitting in a chair or lying in bed or wherever you are when you hold the light on yourself, you just have something you strap on, you walk around and mm -hmm. do whatever you like. I think that's coming in. Okay, that would be cool. Now, last question, um, and it actually doesn't have necessarily to do with la laser therapy. Do you have any tools you use to uh, improve your own health or perform better? Like, what do you focus on? Sleep or diet? Like, um, just I, would say, I would say the light is probably most. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a health nut at all. I mean, you know, I try and get some sleep. I'm not big into healthy eating, you know, any of this stuff. I think the light is probably the main thing. You're just like, I need, I'll, I'll take my light and uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll eat my good food. Uh, um, I hear it. The, 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 the argument is that if you use light therapy, maybe it'll allow you to get away with all the other things that are bad for you, you know? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, this has been fascinating and I really appreciate your time. How could people know more about your work? Uh, well, as I say, we, we have edited quite a few books, but there is a, a major book on called the Handbook of Low-Level Light, Low-Level Laser Therapy, which is coming out, I think at the end of the year, it will have about 55 chapters. So when that comes out, it's probably a good idea to look out for it. I'm definitely going to look out for it, and I would recommend the listeners and uh, to definitely uh, buy it when it comes out. And it'll be released on Amazon or something? It'll be on the air, yeah. I have quite a few books on Amazon already, so if anybody does the Handbook <laughs> of Photo Medicine, which you can buy right now, that's got even more chapters. Oh, that's great. So I guess people should just look on Amazon and type in Dr. Michael Hamblin or something. You got it. And they'll find your books. Great. Um, thank you so much, and uh, I thank you for spreading the word and doing your research, and keep it up, because this is definitely... You're single-handedly helping so many people's lives, um, and it's it's really great work that you're doing. Oh, so well, I enjoyed our chat. So <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a great day. And you. Bye bye.